housekeeping notes as we get going here. Everybody on the call is in listen-only mode. That means um, you don't have audio to participate. But we do want this to be a very interactive discussion. So in the chat field, I imagine you've part participated in some webinars before. Please just enter your questions and your comments. Ron and I will be looking through those throughout the session and we'll be covering as much as we possibly can from the participants. So again, please don't hesitate to use that chat box and those, that question field, and we will engage as many as possible. Please note that we're going to be live tweeting during the session today. You can use the hashtag Clean Energy Survey, and we'd love to hear your voice during the conversation. I'm going to hand it over now to Clean Edge Managing Director, Ron Pernick. Thanks, Bryce, and I want to welcome everyone to today's webinar on the 2015 release of our annual U.S. Homeowners on Clean Energy and National Survey. With me today to help us dissect and deep diver into this dive, deep, excuse me, dive deeper into this year's survey results are Solar City CEO Lyndon Rive and acclaimed pollster, founder of the Zogby Poll, and senior analyst at Zogby Analytics, John Zogby. Uh, I'd like to welcome both of you, gentlemen. Thank you, As, and good morning, everybody. Great to have you guys here. And I think we're going to have a very lively and interactive conversation, as we like to do with these webinars, is um, really get a lot of dialogue going. So as Bryce mentioned, please get your questions in. And what I'm going to do right now is just walk everyone through some of the top line findings. And, and then we'll go into a moderate conversation with both John and Lyndon. And, and then we'll take questions from the audience. And I think today's webinar will be about 45 minutes long. Um, so as quick background, um, as I said earlier, this is our second annual release of the survey, uh, commissioned by Clean Edge and Solar City and conducted by Zogby Analytics. The online poll surveyed 1,400 U.S. homeowners to uncover consumer attitudes and purchasing trends around clean energy products and services and broader energy opinions. Based on a confidence interval of 95%, the margin of error for the survey was plus or minus 2.7 percentage points. In addition to the online survey, Clean Edge once again looked at the compound annual growth rates for a range of clean tech sectors, from solar PV to LEDs, to track the broader shift that's happening in clean energy. Um, so let's look at some of the major findings come out of the polls. Those who tracked it last year, uh, there are some similarities and definitely some differences because we added in uh, new questions this year. Um, and I just want to let everyone know that if you want to take a look at the report and you haven't done that yet, you can download it off either the Clean Edge or the Solar City website. Um, so the four main areas of findings are Americans overwhelmingly choose solar and wind over natural gas, nuclear, and coal. And we're going to dive deeper into those numbers today. Um, for consumers, it continues to be about economics and saving money. More than half of investors polled, and this is the first time we ask any questions related to investing, uh, more than half of investors polled considered the social and environmental impacts of their investments. But as we'll see, returns trump sustainability. And finally, homeowners overwhelmingly back federal support of clean energy, and similar to last year's survey, oppose utility-driven roadblocks. Uh, as I said earlier, each year we do the compounded annual growth rate numbers. So before we jump into the survey results, I'd like to provide just a quick snapshot of what we're finding. Um, as we highlight in the report, lead building, solar PV, utility scale clean electricity generation, energy star buildings, and hybrid vehicles are all experiencing double digital CAGRs in the 20 to 56 percent range over an 11 year period. Utility scale clean electricity generation in the U.S. reflects this significant shift that we're seeing from coal and nuclear to renewables, deep efficiency, and natural gas. In 2014, for example, more than half of all new electricity generating capacity in the U.S. came from solar and wind. And last year, 6.2 gigawatts of solar PV was installed nationwide, up from just 440 megawatts in 2009 an order of magnitude increase. Over the past four to five years, for which we have reliable data, CAGRs for EVs and LEDs have been in the triple digits. These are growth rates more akin to high tech than the energy sector, and point to the need to better understand what's driving this monumental shift among consumers within the US economy. Um, so 
So as a quick reminder, uh, please use the chat box, get your questions in, and we'll get to those at the end of the webinar. Um, now let's dig a bit deeper into this year's survey results. As I noted earlier, Americans overwhelmingly choose solar and wind over other energy sources. Um, similar to other surveys that have found broad support for clean energy, we found that 87% of Americans, nearly 9 in 10, believe renewables are important to the nation's energy future. Um, but this year, for the first time, we asked homeowners to select which energy sources they believe are most important to the nation's energy future. So we weren't just asking, you know, are renewables important? Yes. But which energy sources do they believe are most important to the nation's future? And respondents were able to select up to three choices. Solar at 50%, you can see the, the table here, and wind at 42% led the pack, followed by natural gas 33% and energy efficiency at 25%. Far lower were one-time energy stalwarts nuclear power at 14%, coal at 8%, and you can also see that biofuels don't do very well and they come in at the bottom at 7%. A recent Gallup poll found similar results with respondents picking solar and wind over all other energy sources. Lyndon, what, what do you make of these findings? As someone deep in the solar sector, can you share insights on what this might mean for the industry moving forward? I'd love to get your take on this. Sure. You know, it's uh, when we look at the data, um, this is actually not that surprising. Um, often people get confused with total energy, and they match the total solar production or wind production against all other energy sources. And, and I think that's a bad way to, to look at it, as you're comparing a new technology against a legacy technology that's been around for 50 plus years. Um, so it, the, the new, one, new technology needs time to, to deploy. So the best way to look at true adoption is the rate of new capacity installed every year, how much of that is wind or solar. So if you look at solar, in 2009, new capacity deployed in the U.S. was 2%. So that's 2009. If you fast forward now, five years later, to uh, the uh, first three quarters of 2014, I don't have the uh, fourth quarter data yet, but first three quarters of 2014, solar is now over 35% of all new capacity deployed in the U.S. So it's gone from 2% to over 35% of, uh, of, of all new capacity. Solar is now the single largest new energy source um, uh, in, in the country. It overtook wind, solar, natural gas, and coal. So I think um, people are becoming more and more aware of solar. Uh, solar historically has had a stigma that it's expensive. Um, uh, and we still struggle with that, quite frankly. Um, but once consumers and businesses realize that it, is, uh, it costs you less than the current cost of energy, um, it, it becomes somewhat of a no-brainer. But my, my yeah, forecast is... It, over the next five years, I can see solar getting to 50 percent, so, so maintain that growth rate. Linda, let me ask you, as I mentioned earlier in my opening remarks, uh, more than half of all new generating capacity in the U.S. came from solar and wind. It was 53 percent. But, but what I'm wondering here, which is sort of in line with what you were just talking about, what I'm wondering here is what, what do you sort of make of the fact that you know, you're, you're polling Americans, they can choose all these different energy sources, and we're finding that solar and wind are resoundingly at the top. I mean, I know this may not be surprising to you in the, in the industry. I think to other people, that level of support, and it showed up in the Gallup poll as well, uh, might be a little surprising. Is it just for you, it's the obvious that, of course, renewables would be at the top? Yeah, I, I think people are starting to realize the importance of renewable energies. I mean, the, um, uh, some, some may debate. Uh, and have opinions about uh, global warming, but there's no debate about climate change. <laughs> uh, East and West Coast have experienced dramatic climate change uh, over the last uh, few years. I mean, the, the West Coast is having the worst droughts ever. East Coast is having the worst storms ever. Um, and this is going to become a real problem. Uh, and, I, and I think uh, consumers are starting to realize that you know, solar is a clean source of energy, and, and it, it's always available. Right. And, and just to go back, you, you're thinking that in the next 
I think you said within five years you'd see solar being about 50% of all new uh, capacity additions in the U.S.? Yeah, that, 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 okay. that's my uh, forecast. Great. Okay, you heard it here. Uh, John, uh, I want to go into the deeper numbers here. We have these cross tabs. You know, in the public report we don't publish all these cross tabs. So folks are getting to see these for the first time. Um, Support among solar, as I said, was strong. And, and what was amazing to me, it was strong across all major demographics. I mean, it was number one pick among all major demographics. And as the following cross tabs here show, it was not only strong among where people live, gender and age, but also across political parties and regions. Uh, a particular note here, solar was chosen at a higher percentage by those over 65 than younger respondents, which, which I found very interesting. So if you look here, uh, actually, it was 54.7 percent for 65 plus, 18 to 29, 45.2. Still high for both, but higher among older populations. And then it was highest in the South, where we don't always think of obviously a lot of sunshine in the South, but not as much uh, uh, deployment necessarily. So, what do you make of these results? Is, is there much to read into here in terms of these slight differences, even though it's number one across all these major demographics? No, absolutely. I, I mean, first of all, uh, solar and wind, you know, have moved beyond the esoteric and the political to being real and visible. And so, you know, what you have seen, if not quite an explosion, is is definitely just, uh, you know, anecdotally driving around. You see solar being installed. It's it's uh, like folks used to say about unemployment. It's, it, it, it's an esoteric issue for most, except if you see your neighbor is unemployed, then it becomes very real. If someone in your neighborhood, someone nearby, a relative has gone solar, it becomes not only real, but it becomes uh, more and more acceptable. Uh, the second thing, I think, is that uh, non-renewable energies uh, have had the exact opposite of a renaissance. Uh, the, the, the world, the region of, um, of, of oil um, is a volatile region. And that's not simply the Middle East, although that's enough right there, but it's also Russia, Central Asia, Venezuela, and, and, and so on. And then, you know, interestingly, we saw in the polling this uh, back in the late 90s and until 9-11, this kind of new wave of acceptability of nuclear. Uh, yeah. And that's because, you know, Three Mile Island, Chernobyl were things of the past. We had a whole new generation that did not know nuclear. Now we move into the era of Fukushima and fracking. And while fracking of natural gas certainly has its supporters, it most certainly has its detractors as well. So solar then becomes not only more visible and acceptable, but solar becomes um, uh, popular. Well, well, that's a perfect segue in the next slide. Before I move on, Lyndon, do you have any observations here on, on sort of regional or support at different levels? Yeah, you know, I, I wouldn't mind giving a little, like, uh, history here on the, uh, on the solar industry. The, uh, often people, uh, specifically on the political side, view solar as more of a democratic um, uh, support, but actually it has total bipartisan support. And in fact, if you go back to um, the beginning of the 30% solar tax credit, in 2007, that initiative was led by a Republican senator. And in 2008, it was led again by a Republican senator. And then it was also uh, the eight-year extension um, was approved by uh, a Republican president. So uh, it absolutely has a bipartisan support, and it's... It's unfortunately that the the last few years um, in the uh, cylinder uh, blow up that it became more of a democratic uh, political football versus any any reality. But in reality, it's it's supported by both parties. Indeed, and 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 that shows up very strongly here in in all of our research. Uh, so it's good to see that. And we'll get into some questions later about the potential disconnect between constituents. And, and, and their representatives. Um, I, I think this next slide, I, I, you know, John, you, you sort of got into this a bit. You, you guys may both have comments on it, um, but I think it's a really important one to look at. So, so what's going on here is we're looking at support for natural gas and nuclear. And what you can see is this 
pretty significant decline uh, among age groups. So um, while solar, as I mentioned earlier, was actually the, the older population supported solar more than the younger, the exact opposite is happening here. So um, you, you, you get the, the 70 years of age, you know, 43% support for natural gas importance, and then it drops down to 27% uh, by 18 to 24. So, so a real significant drop among younger populations. And then here uh, w with nuclear, uh, which obviously uh, there, there looks to be some kind of generational uh, dis differences for sure, certain, uh, 70 years of age, 24%. And by the time you get to the 18 to 24 year old, uh, you're at 1%. Um, anything surprising in, in that for you, John, or kind of reflects what you were saying earlier? It's, it's what, I've been, uh, what I said earlier. I, I mean, clearly, those 18 to 24, let's call them all millennials and take it yep. right up to the cutoff, 18 to 34. This is the era of Fukushima. That was very visible. That was the, the, the sort of thing that was not only visible, but high intensity, earth shattering. That, I mean, that was the 9-11 uh, of, uh, of the uh, nuclear power industry, essentially. And, and that is something they will carry with them for the rest of their lives. Great. And as I mentioned earlier, there was a Gallup poll done. And, and if you guys look at the, anyone in the audience who's interested, we can send you the links. But both between our polling and the Gallup poll, uh, the, the same uh, shift over time with nuclear the declining and, and uh, with the younger respondents, certainly. Um, let, let's move on to... Let me just add in that I'm really glad that, that Gallup is, um, is kind of learning how to do this well. I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, and indeed, and it's good to have both of you guys doing it, so we're happy for that. Um, so let me take you out of this next one. Um, I didn't know we'd get political on the polling. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Respondents say that they care about the environment, uh, but there's been a shift between 2015 and 2014 results. So in 2014, uh, 35 percent, uh, or 2014, 35 percent of respondents said they always or most of the time consider environmental impacts. In 2015, the overall positive response rate was down to 28 percent, and the rarely or never selection was up five points to 33 percent. Uh, John, we, we spoke about this briefly, but, but how do you view this shift? I, I know you've said the results are nuanced and that mm -hmm. the environment appears to connect more with certain subgroups, millennials and others, but tell me how we might interpret this year-over-year -year change and should we look in, into it very deeply or not? Well, we're obviously going to follow it again and, and see what the longer-term trend suggests, but remember the average consumer is, is experiencing cross currents. You know, on one hand, important to think about the environment. I think that they've internalized that and the fact that, you know, one in four to one in three, you know, consider the environment and their decisions uh, uh, is, is very high. By the same token, um, it's tough out there. Uh, everything you hear about growing inequality, about stagnant wages and salaries, about unemployment, underemployment means that the, the average consumer has got a number of things to, to consider, you know, when they, when they go to the checkout counter. And so it's not surprising to me. In fact, uh, I, I, I would argue that it's a given that while they're, they're certainly going to look at the, at the package and look at the information and be concerned about the labor or the environment or whatever that, that was involved, by the same token, uh, They've also got to save a buck here and there. Great. Uh, Lyndon, the, the next survey question points to something that you and I have talked about before, and that was loud and clear in last year's survey as well. Uh, so probably not huge surprises. While, while Americans say they care about the environment, it's cost savings that motivate them. Um, and if you look at this survey response here, saving money topped the list as key motivator at 82%, while reducing my environmental impact uh, was at 34 um, percent. I'm often amazed at how some folks in the clean energy sector that we, we talk with at Clean Edge overlook this key motivator around cost and savings. I think at Solar City you guys nailed that one. But I just love your take on this from your vantage point at Solar City. Uh, obviously it supports your business model, but I, I would just love to get your take on this pretty significant margin between those two options. Yeah, you know, we've seen this in markets that, that we enter and when we try to uh, try to determine what's the best pricing uh, that, that we should offer to our customers. 
So when we go into a market, you know, we're competing against the cost of retail energy. And so, so we, uh, over the years, we've, we've tried different discounts to the cost of energy. And so we tried 5% discounts. And uh, a 5% discount just, just wasn't enough to, to, to get the conversion rate. Hmm. So we, 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 we find that the, the sweet spot for our, our, our customers was in the 15 to 20% discount of uh, retail electricity. And, and then the conversion rate was, was higher. We also tried, in some areas where we could, uh, an even higher discount rate. Um, so if you're looking at the 25 to 30%, we actually didn't see an increase in conversion. Hmm. So, so the, what we found was, you know, if, if you show a good savings, it doesn't have to be uh, uh, incredible, but just a good savings, um, given the choice of paying more for dirty power or, or less for clean power, um, people then uh, adopt clean power. Um, but given the choice, but it's marginally the same, then your, your conversion rate is, is not high enough. And how much do you play up the environment? Obviously, uh, cost savings, money leads. That's got to be the key messaging. How much do you also play up the environmental impact of, of switching to solar in your messaging? Uh, we do. Uh, so I'd say the, the three main messages that, that we communicate is savings, control, and environmental. Got it. And the control, does that go over just, is that that I have fewer maintenance requirements? Is that that I have now control my own energy destiny? So, so, so you, you know uh, for the next 20 years exactly what you're going to be paying for your energy. Yeah. And you know so where your energy you. comes from. So, so, so it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hedge, you know, where you, and it's important to where you get your energy from. Um, and so, so that type of control our consumers like. Um, and then, of course, um, the environmental benefits. Great. And then obviously and, and we... I actually we think, uh, I actually think this, this next year or so, um, the environmental benefit is actually going to increase. Like the water usage, in the way water is being consumed today, is going to become a, a big problem, specifically here on the, on the, on the West Coast. Um, most people don't know this, but the amount of water you use to create the electricity for your house is more than water consumption your, uh, itself for that house. So the utilities use more water in providing the electricity for your house than all your dishwashing, all your laundry, all your showers, um, uh, uh, and that includes homes with pools. Um, so uh, as that gets more educated, uh, as consumers get more educated on that, um, water consumption is, is going to become a, a bigger and bigger issue. Um, we, we've been seeing here on the West Coast some markets are starting to do ration, uh, to ration water. But in reality, the best thing you, for you to do is if you were to install a solar system, I know it sounds self-serving, but, but in re, uh, bear with me. If you were to install a solar system, the net effect of that is better than not using water at all. Well, the, if you could show the embodied water in various energy sources at the retail rate and then a solar rooftop, that'd be great. I, I think you're right the, that that environmental piece around water is going to be huge. And thanks for pointing that out. But let, let's move to the next question. And, and, and John, I'd like you to sort of take a look at this with me. Um, so while 38% of homeowners surveyed in 2015 said they think that solar power is more expensive than their current retail rates, this is down 5 percentage points from last year's 43%. So this is, what we're looking at here is sort of a uh, comparison between 2014 and 2015 results. Um, and as I said earlier, I hate to read too much in any longitudinal analysis, which is two years of data, but we've, we've got this here. So let's start with you, John. Uh, what, what do you read into this? And then, Lyndon, if you have anything to add, we'll, we'll move over to you. So, John? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, again, you're fighting uh, the industry, that is, a powerful cross-current. This time, the cross-current is that overall, fuel prices went down and were perceived to have gone down. The cost of home heating, fuel, cost of natural gas, this was the last two years, the last year in particular, a time when energy was cheaper. So one would think then that the, the cost of solar, the lag um, uh, from when folks thought that solar was prohibitively expensive would carry over even more um, you know, into, uh, into the, 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 the present uh, time when the reality is that, uh, that 
folks see it as less expensive, and that's a good sign. Probably what might have been a better sign if fuel prices uh, had actually, you know, for, for non-renewables had actually gone up. Indeed, indeed. All right, and, and, and this happened even against that backdrop. So, okay, let, let's move on to the last piece of, of, of this uh, key finding. Hey, Ron, I um, just want to make one, one comment there. Oh, um, sure. So, uh, you know, a lot of people still uh, think that oil has much to do with uh, U.S. energy rates or electricity rates, um, and, and it just doesn't. Um, in, in fact, if, if, if oil was free, um, it would have close to zero effect, like 1% effect on retail energy rates in, in the U.S., excluding Hawaii. Huh. Oh, you guys, I'm sorry. I assumed he was referring to natural gas costs. So, um, but, but that's a good point. And, 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 John, I don't know which one you're looking at. I mean, there really is no connection, as we know, between oil and electricity, but between oil and transportation fuels. Um, but natural, what do you take, how do you read that, Linda, with natural gas? Because, I mean, natural gas prices have come down. Of course, that doesn't usually impact my retail electricity rates very much. Yeah, it has come down, um, but retail rates is actually gone up. In, in for for utility market. electricity, yeah. Yeah, yeah so, so this is the other part that um, uh, is becoming more and more obvious. Um, transmission and distribution is uh, the biggest cost. Uh, it's also the, the, the oldest, oldest infrastructure that needs continual upgrades. So um, uh, when your variable cost has come down to as low as it has for natural gas, but your retail rates are still going up, it's a clear indication that there's still a lot of infrastructure upgrades that, that have to occur. Indeed. Um, well, well, good point. And, and I, just to remind everyone of that, I mean, we should probably talk about that more uh, as an as a industry and, and just as analysts tracking it, but the, the very little connection between oil and, and electricity pricing. Um, let, let, let's go on now to the last part of this section. So we, we asked which of any clean energy person are you likely to make in the next year. Um, and, and similar to last year, LEDs came up on top. 27% uh, of respondents saying they're likely to purchase LED bulbs this year. The Kager data shows that quite uh, extensively. I mean, it's triple-digit growth rates, as I mentioned earlier. People are buying LEDs. They're now available at Home Depot for less than $5 a, a bulb, even for a Philips. Uh, so, so that's the top choice. Uh, next plan purchase are smart uh, thermostats, then Energy Star rated hot water heaters, so you, you can see the data here, um, and, and then double, triple pane windows, and then hybrid cars. Uh, all top five purchases this year, like last, the, the, the same as last year, uh, are products that save money by reducing energy consumption. They have relatively low barrier to entry, uh, although you have to think about putting in double and triple pane windows uh, and things like that, but LEDs are obviously relatively inexpensive. And, and four uh, of the top five are in the efficiency category. Uh, Lyndon, how do you interpret some of these findings here, uh, just in terms of next purchases? Obviously, it's interesting data for us all to look at. Yeah, so to me, this, this is um, super interesting. As it clearly shows that the inertia or the effort of making the change is what determines how many people would do it. Like for the most part, it is uh, tremendously financially, uh, it's a good financial decision to upgrade your water heater. And if it's older than eight years or ten years, upgrade your water heater and it'll be an easy payback. Um, but most people don't. We were actually in the energy efficiency upgrade business and it tends to be a market where when the product breaks, that's when they will upgrade to an efficient water heater. But they're not going to upgrade until, until it actually breaks. Um, reason why, why I think LED light bulbs are so, so high is to, to put in LED light bulbs, it's super easy. You just go buy the light bulb and you put it in. Um, and the other one probably uh, has blown. So that's why you upgrade into LEDs. Um, so educating consumers how easy the moves are is, is something that, that, that we definitely have to improve in the solar sector. At 6%, that, that's too low. Great. Well, we'll be tracking it over time. So uh, now let's go into the investor uh, section of the, the, the survey. We, we asked questions for the first time on uh, how they view the social and environmental concerns and how they impact uh, their investments. So 
first of all, we, we, we did find that a majority, or 52 percent, consider the social environmental impact of their investments. Uh, they also expressed it a somewhat higher percentage in interest in impact investments, which promised not only financial returns, but social and environmental returns. So I'll take you to that slide, and you can see the results here. Uh, 74 percent said they would make such investments if they offer a potentially higher return. 61 percent would make such investments with returns at least as good as, uh, at least what they consider as good as other options. And then interest drops to 22 percent if the impact investment would offer lower returns. Lyndon, last year Solar City started offering solar bonds to the public. I'm wondering how this year's survey results on investment decisions sync up with what you're learning as you offer solar bonds into the retail marketplace. Yeah, so with our solar bonds, you know, the, the program has been very successful. Um, it, it's still, we still need to communicate and get the word out uh, a, a lot better. Um, I think the, there's, there's a large market for it. Um, uh, uh, as, as consumers would like to have a good return or fair return, and they also know that it gets applied to, to social good. Um, but, but the challenge is, specifically in the financial uh, institutions, everybody has a way of making investments today. So we have to get into the, the, the process of how people actually make investments, when they make investments decisions, and then when you get into that decision factor, uh, I think uh, double bottom line type of investments will, will increase. But unless whoever is offering that, that type of investment gets into the uh, process of when the consumer is making that investment decision, the adoption rate will still be fairly low. And so I think um, for those companies who do offer that, sort of on top of products, um, that will be the next few years uh, focus to get into the, the, the process of their decision making. Great. Um, John, did you have anything to add before we move on? Yeah, I do. I, I think what you're going to see, uh, first of all, these results are perfectly consistent and actually steadily growing from uh, the beginning of our tracking this kind of, uh, of issue over the last, say, 15 years. Um, I think what's important here, though, is that uh, you're, you have many, many more individual independent investors, particularly among people under, under 40, whereas those over 40 have pretty much grown up uh, using a financial advisor or a broker, and the, those brokers were not geared towards what we would call social or environmental in investments. Um, right. They steered away from those. The independent investors are people that you can reach directly, and obviously if the rate of return is, is decent enough, the individuals will, uh, will, will buy it. Great. Uh, we are starting to get lots of questions. They're, they're coming in. Please keep those going. Um, we're going to move to the last section of our key findings, um, and then we'll open up to the audience and, and try to wrap up in, in, in a good time here. Um, so, you know, in a way, saving maybe the most interesting to last in a way. We, we hadn't asked these questions last year. Uh, we really wanted to get inside the head of, of, of Americans and homeowners in terms of what they were thinking about in terms of supporting the growth of the renewable energy industry. It's one thing to say, you know, we care about it, we think it's important, but then what do you do with that? So as we wrote in the report, while members of Congress are divided on whether or not to extend federal uh, incentives for clean energy, our survey finds that Americans are not. 74%, so almost equivalent to the 78% who support renewables. Uh, so 74% of homeowners believe that the government should continue to provide renewable energy incentives uh, with high levels of support across all major party affiliations, which we talked about earlier. So even in this question of how federal support, 82% of Democrats support such policies, as do two-thirds of Republicans and 72% of independents. A recent poll from Resources for the Future, Stanford University, and the New York Times found almost identical results, with 80% of Americans favoring tax breaks for companies to produce more electricity from water, wind, and solar power, supports for tax breaks to build nuclear power plants, not a question we had asked, but in this other poll, uh, on the other hand, was only 36% uh, 
down from around 50% in 2009. John, Lyndon, uh, and Lyndon, uh, how do you interpret the seeming disconnect between elected officials and what their constituents are asking for in the shift to renewables? I'll start with either one of you. I, I'm, I'm ready to roll. Go um, for it. You know, we, in our business of, of polling, we measure frequencies and intensities. This is high frequency, 74% uh, uh, agree. Anything over 70%, technically for me, is consensus. But you see, we also look at intensities, meaning that if there are 15% or 20% uh, uh, who s strongly disagree, who violently oppose, who are in a position to make a lot of noise, they're the ones that get the attention and they're the ones that, uh, that drive the policy. And so the disconnect here is that the public, and you're absolutely correct, of all political stripes support um, uh, uh, an idea or a policy like this, but where's the intensity and where's the, the voice and where's the, uh, hence the political power to persuade uh, you know, representatives? That's what's missing. Lyndon, do you want to add anything? Yeah, so when it comes to uh, the, the average voter in, in the U.S., everybody, according to the data says, everybody wants uh, clean energy. Um, I've been to Washington, D.C. now for a few times. Um, the challenge is when you have a technology source that has gone from 2% to 35% of all new energy is now solar, that is very threatening and disruptive to the incumbent energy sources. Um, those incumbent energy sources are leveraging every possible muscle they can to persuade our, our political leaders. Um, it's unfortunately the way it, it, it works, but um, they, they, they are highly influential uh, and um, even with the, the large public support, um, they've managed to, to slow things down. With that being said, in the last few times I've been to, to uh, Washington, D.C., um, the extension of the ITC has gone from no way and how to uh, how do we make this work um, and, and how do we potentially get it uh, extended. So, so it's, there definitely has been a mindset change over the last year or so. Um, followed up by, just as a reminder for everybody in the audience, uh, the fossil fuel industry has over 13 different tax incentives. Um, and I keep them on my phone in case there's ever a debate. Um, so it's, and those are permanent. Um, the, the unfortunate or fortunate thing about the, the, the U.S. is most energy is highly subsidized by, by the government. Um, and uh, when we go to D.C., we don't say take away the fossil fuel industries incentives. Keep them in place. It's fine. Um, but, but don't take away the, the solar industries uh, incentives. Um, as it, it has to compete. Well, at least level the playing field. I, I wonder, Lyndon, because I'll just get into a question, because as I said, a lot are coming in, and, and this goes right to this, this, this image here that we have on the screen. So it says, it seems clear that Americans want renewables. What is the renewable energy industry doing to, combat, you know, to take on the utilities who are trying to set up roadblocks? And what are they doing at the federal or state level to make sure there are support systems or you know, incentives in place? So I guess the question that I, I think this, this person might be asking is, what can the renewable energy industry do? What are they doing? And perhaps we could extend that to what actions might people who are listening uh, could take that are on this webinar. Any, any thoughts on uh, type of actions that might be needed in the next few years here? Yeah, let me um, separate the, the two big Please. fights that we have. Sure. So, so we have uh, one that's a federal um, push uh, that the solar industry is going to try and uh, explain to our, our political leaders that if you want solar, if you want a clean uh, energy future, clean energy needs to compete and uh, needs to continue getting its tax incentives the same as the fossil fuel industry. Um, it, it, it's not appropriate to have one energy source that is polluting still get all its incentives and the one that's not polluting gets penalized. So, so that, that, that's one side. So that's the federal side, and that's trying to get the um, solar tax credit to, to, to get extended. Um, on the state side, 
Um, that's where actually most of the battle is occurring right now. And it, it, it's not necessarily state-specific, although it is state-specific, it's more utility-specific. And um, in areas where adoption of solar is becoming high, you, um, utilities are seeing competition, they are seeing that consumers are getting choice now, and they, they're pushing back 100% on this, and, and they're fighting it as much as they, they possibly can. They, they are coming out with their uh, cost studies of saying how much it's cost the, the non-solar rate, uh, rate payer. Uh, however, when the independent studies are done, uh, that is not correct. Um, so so, so those, those debates will continue. Um, we've had significant debates in Arizona. We're having debates right now in, in Nevada. We, we continue to have the debates in, in California. Um, on the East Coast, the debates aren't uh, as strong because it, it actually is a competitive market. So, so when you don't have a monopoly providing the services, it, it's not as a, a um, up and front and center uh, debate. So uh, what the solar industry is doing on, on uh, more of the West Coast states where we are competing against the uh, monopoly utility is we are educating our consumers that, uh, that they've got to fight for their, their right for competition. I mean, the number one cause of innovation is competition. And there's a reason why the uh, energy sector hasn't innovated much, because there's been no competition. Um, bring competition to the equation, you get better services, uh, more reliable. Um, so so that, that's what we're doing on, on, on the West Coast. We're also uh, hiring independent experts to really understand the benefits that solar can provide. You know, solar provides energy during the day. It, it helps reduce the wear and tear on the infrastructure, which then reduces the necessity to continue investing to upgrades. Um, and that's the actual true issue with the utility sector. They need to make those investments. They need to continue, because without those investments, they have no growth. But that's how the utility makes money. And most utilities actually don't make money by selling the energy. Um, they make money in uh, upgrading the infrastructure. And then we're also working with our, our policy, our state policy leaders uh, and PEC members of how do we change the business model? Because right now, there is a natural friction. It makes sense. Every um, dollar that we invest is a dollar that the utility does not invest. So um, until that policy change occurs, there will always be a fight between the solar industry and the utility sector. But we need to solve this and we need to work together. And one of the areas that I, I'm, I'm hopeful we'll get to is to make it possible for the utility to make money off the solar sector. And, and how they would do that is they could actually uh, do energy as a service or infrastructure as a service. Uh, today, when a homeowner installs a solar system, they're providing a service to the utility. Is it, how can we create a business model where the utility can actually use that service, you know, voltage control, peak load shifting, demand management, those type of services, um, and uh, uh, make a profit off that versus a pass-through? Today, it's a pass-through cost, so it's, they make no profit off it. And um, so I think that would be uh, a goal for the solar industry, is to make a business model for the, uh, the utilities to, to make money off, off the sector. Do, do you see a future where the utility, and then let's move on, but, but where the utility industry is, is more of a transmission and distribution player? And I mean, that happens in some places in some countries where the utility is primarily the, the, the infrastructure, and then there's lots of energy providers. I, I, see, I see that has to become the future. Yeah. The utility yeah. is essentially going to be the line manager that manages the flow of energy. Um, they have all the controls, they manage uh, the balancing, but they, they get the energy from everywhere. They get the energy from centralized power generation, they get the energy from a homeowner. Um, and then their job is to manage the lines and uh, provide that service. Yeah, now, and, and another piece of that, okay, go ahead. From a utility perspective, the reason why they're fighting, because it's just not as an attractive business model as maintaining everything. Um, so, so that's that's why uh, it, there's there's some challenges, but but that's where I see the utility business model going. 
Yeah, no, and, and I think your comment earlier, which I often just think of it as decoupling, uh, you know, deep decoupling, but, but how could we get there? Well, let's go, this, this is the last question that we're covering today or sort of showing up on the screen. But, but before we go to a few more questions from the audience, I just want to take a look at the, the opposition piece of this. Because, you know, the utilities, you know, as we found out last year, people don't dis necessarily dislike their utilities. There's a role they played for them. But they definitely don't like the utilities, as we found out this year, getting in the way. And, and opposition to potential solar fees charged by utilities. And they will talk about that because there may be a role, obviously, where the utilities plays a role. They need to get some compensation. But by a 61 to 24 margin, those survey oppose, oppose solar fees. And, and what I found interesting, and then we can just go on from there, but opposition was higher among Republicans, 66 percent, and rural communities, 67 uh, percent, then Democrats at 59 percent, and large city dwellers at 47 percent. Um, you know, there's a lot of folks that try to split up the country around renewables, but I think this shows very clearly here that this, as we mentioned earlier, is, is quite bipartisan. Um, do you, either of you want to comment on that before I go to a couple questions from the audience? No. Great. Um, so, so one thing that came up, and, and I mentioned it earlier, we, we had that slide showing support in the South for solar quite high, actually higher uh, in terms of future energy sources. Um, a lot of people, we've had two or three questions now. Uh, sort of saying, um, you know, it seems there's a lot of opportunity in the South, a lot of interest, but it hasn't quite happened yet. Uh, is there a reason for that disconnect, and where do you see things going? And, and Lyndon, why don't I take that to you since that's, you're in the ground on, in a lot of these states? Yeah, so uh, it's, it's interesting that there's high demand there, because um, so, so is not there for the most part yet. Um, the number one factor uh, for for solar to expand to to the the local market is what is the cost of retail energy and in many of the, those the states it, it's a coal based state and so the cost of retail energy is it's fairly low um, we will be moving into um, those markets as our costs come down uh, and and offering similar services but at this point because energy rates are fairly low, it's just not a, a big market. Then, then you have states like Florida, I'm not sure if that exactly falls into to the south. Um, the, uh, uh, there there's state policy that prevents the adoption of solar, uh, which, which makes no sense. Um, uh, the, there the state will not allow a homeowner to essentially get a lease or a power purchase agreement. Um, when they, they can, it's just they, it's going to be uh, massive. Uh, there's big taxes imposed onto the uh, homeowner if they do that. So, so it's a state policy that prevents affordable uh, clean energy or affordable solar energy. And um, so that has to get fixed before you'll see real adoption in the state. And we've seen that in a few states where the utilities have successfully um, uh, got policy change to not allow third-party owned solar systems. And so that, that we, we have to work at undoing that policy. Got it. Thank you. Uh, J John, um, I think this may be, will be geared towards you first. Um, so attitudes towards global warming and climate change action, I think, there's a sense that, and I think there's other polling that's shown this, sort of on a, at least for now, is, has been on a downward trend, and yet uh, the clean energy findings are sort of on an upward trend. Do you read anything into that? Is it is it really just what we found out that it's a cost savings, it's a it's an economic story, uh, but people are just wondering about the connection between those two sort of disparate uh, polling uh, findings that are happening. John, do we still have you? There you go. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, I, I think that the global warming issue has become distorted by, uh, by politics, by language, by ideology. It's become almost a, a badge of honor to take one side or, or the other. And, and um, 
meanwhile, those who identify with the environment, the future of the planet, and, and so on, those numbers are actually growing. I mean, for example, one of the things that we have been tracking uh, over the years are self-identified Christian conservatives under the ages uh, under the age of 35, who who for them the number one or number two issue is man's stewardship of God's earth. Um, you know, we've we've achieved a consensus when it comes to the issue of global warming, where the disagreement may just um, be on on causality, but uh, across the board, uh, folks do care about it and care about human behavior, uh, you know, re re regarding it in the future of the planet. Now, with that said, we also live um, in what many still consider to be recessionary time or tough times. And I think what, what we have is a cultural mindset uh, that's, that will probably last another 10 years that says, uh, I've got to hold on to my dollar and and not spend uh, and 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 uh, not, not spend frivolously. And so again, I relate these cross currents that I've been talking about. Great. Uh, I'm going to wrap up with one last question, I, Linda. I think I'll throw it to you. Um, a, a couple of people are asking about sort of pushing the envelope, um, and I think you know increasingly uh, we're tracking uh, some you know regional governments that are going for 100% renewables. There obviously are uh, companies that are doing that. Uh, Apple is now at 100%, and there are a whole bunch of others who are you know, equally getting there, pushing the envelope. So uh, the question, and, and it doesn't really have much to do with the poll, but if you don't mind, Lyndon, um, do you have a good examples of any real estate developers or real estate developments that are happening right now that might be, if you ha have any ideas on this, might be military as well, that are really pushing the envelope? And, and getting to you know deep efficiency and 100% uh, you know net zero renewable energy use. So can you yeah. think of any offhand that we might point out? Um, so, so I can actually give you the, the names. Um, we about a month ago we launched microgrids, and the uh, the the interest that we get into it is, is quite remarkable. So these are um, uh, small communities, uh, islands. Uh, where they're trying to become 100 essentially 100 percent renewable, and so we we're actually proposing solutions to them where we, we've installed solar systems on all the homes, uh, manage the entire the entire grid, and then you still do have a, a diesel generator, but but I like where where it's going. It's going to a point where fossil fuel is becoming the alternative source of energy, not not <laughs> solar. Solar, and and I actually see that um, as the future. And then we have some home builders when they build uh, new homes, like Shea. Shea is one of our partners, Shea Home Builders, and they have a whole program where it's um, Shea Zero, uh, where any uh, new homeowner that buys those homes uh, essentially has a zero energy bill. And so they design it with efficient uh, light bulbs, um, efficient uh, uh, insulation, and then uh, as well as a solar system. Great. Well, I, I knew that today's uh, webinar was going to be lively and interactive, as I promised. So I want to thank both you, uh, Lyndon and, and John, for your time and insights today. Um, I, I also want to let the audience know that this webinar has been recorded, and we'll be posting it on the Clean Edge website. And, Later today, it may also go up on Solar City, but take a look at, at those websites. As well, you can download the full report and share it with others. Again, both available at Clean Edge and Solar City website. So thanks again to all of you and all of our panelists, and look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you.